So I'm doing a, a Viking themed D and D campaign. And I have to say that the way that this game views luck is, well, it's a little dicey. The way that we view luck today seems to be very much focused on chance. Having good luck simply means that whatever forces associated with random chance seem to fall to your favor more often than probability might dictate. It seems defined by its unpredictability and may be summed up as coincidence. However, the conception of luck among the Norse and the Vikings was quite a bit different from that. They saw luck as part of who you are your skill, your beauty, or any number of other characteristics that you may have. But it was also quite a bit more than that. Let's dive into it. You know, I never thought of calling these videos dives, but my name's Ocean, and I... So, your luck might manifest itself as your ability to catch fish, as, say, fishing luck. Or perhaps your skill as a fighter grants you luck in matches. This could be something that you can develop and you can foster as an individual in order to attain greater luck. To practice with somebody and share tricks might be sharing your luck or building luck together. But in other cases, there were heroes that were considered men of luck that possessed some quality that brought them luck or made their luck particularly strong. Kings and Jarls were considered men of luck and could send their luck to assist those on missions for them. For example, King Olaf I sent his luck with a messenger to a Jarl in order to recruit him. And when it turned out that this Jarl was an atheist with no interest in joining the Christian king, no doubt Olaf's luck aided the messenger in his mission to ultimately convert this Jarl to Christianity and convince him to join Olaf's kingdom. Which brings us to an interesting element of the Norse concept of luck, which is that it, for a time, survived the change of religion. It doesn't appear that this belief in luck was viewed as heretical or part of the old ways or anything like that. It was just part of how the Norse viewed reality. And it's true that many of the pagan ways, at least temporarily, survived the conversion period, and that the Christian Norse would likely be considered heretical or Christopagan in many ways today. Luck and its function appear to have been like one of these surviving concepts, at least for a time, though many of the nuances of it have been lost to time. Many of the heroes in Icelandic sagas are successful Vikings and could be said to be men who possessed great luck. Egil, for example, was a great poet, a skilled warrior, and managed to amass and retain great wealth over the course of his life. Those who stood against him would be bested by his skills and his wit. But there was also another quality granted to him that it seemed that he was fated to win out in his struggles, even against overwhelming odds. And there are several points in his saga where Eyjol is outnumbered and comes out ahead, even slaying on his own eight or even <laughs> eleven men at once. This is, of course, the man who is credited with writing the famous verse my mother told me at seven years old. And so it only stands to reason that this man in his later years would sail to distant shores and hew many foemen. But with heroes such as Eyjol, it does seem that there's a quality beyond skill at work. It seems that fate is just on their side as favorable threads are woven for them by the Norns themselves. There are other men who seem without luck, usually unsavory people that meet their end in gruesome ways, often as the result of their character traits, putting them in situations of bad luck. Because of this, the Norse concept of luck has been compared to karma, uh, in as much as that honorable actions can lead you to good luck and dishonorable actions can lead you to bad luck. But this doesn't quite seem to be the case, or at least would be an oversimplification of the nuances of the Norse concept of luck. So there's some interesting exceptions to this rule, uh, such as Grettir the Strong and Gisli the Outlaw, who are honorable men, but also bereft of luck, which leads us to questions about the Norse concept of luck. Is it rooted in the individual, or is it something that is beyond our control and woven into the weird by the Norns, guiding aspects of our destiny? It seems that the Norse saw luck in the form of three major aspects. The first is that the actions of the self and the luck that that brings you. There are things that you can do in order to enhance your luck, such as practicing a skill or what might be considered honorable actions. Though the latter 
may not affect your luck. Uh, and the former might depend on a myriad of things, such as how effective your method of practice is. The second aspect of luck seems to be related to destiny, fate, and the Norns, caretakers of the well, the weavers of the web of the weird, which is simplified the, uh, the tapestry of the universe. The Norns themselves are massively complex, but they were reputed to have dominion over certain events in one's life, including the conditions of death. Though, whether or not this falls under predestination would be a complex discussion. Whatever the case, the Norns clearly were seen to have dominion over elements of one's life that would be interpreted as luck. As you wander down your thread in the web as woven by the Norns, you may face events with certain strength, and the opportunities provided to you through the path of your thread would result in an element of luck. Destiny figured heavily into the Norse view of luck, as several sagas have heroes referencing that their time of death is out of their control. As a result, they face the challenges before them with courage. The third element of luck has to do with guardian deities of some kind. One of the heroes in the many Icelandic sagas, Viga Glum, sees in a dream his Hamingja, the feminine guardian of his family's luck. She is traversing the landscape, moving from guarding his grandfather to him. She is depicted as extremely tall, her shoulders touching the sides of mountains as she walks. Gloom invites her into his home, and then wakes. Gloom interprets this as his grandfather's Hamingja coming to rest with him after his death. There isn't much known about these guardian spirits. They seem to be among the Disir, which are a set of feminine guardian spirits of families, and they can even be seen as part of the personal soul. But the word for this particular one is consistent with luck, implying the association with luck and guardianship. There are instances in the sagas referencing Disirblot, a sacrifice to the Disir, done in conjunction with family gatherings and feasts, though... Nothing is known about the particulars regarding the rituals associated with this event. So, when we combine the actions of the individual, the threads of fate, and the guardian spirits, we start to get a coherent view of this concept of luck that influenced the Vikings. It's, it's a bit of a patchwork, and the concept seems to be far more complex and nuanced than what we have access to so that we are able to understand. But... There are effects of this concept. What exactly is a man without luck? How do we see someone who seems to be, have been, like, abandoned by luck? In my video about atheist Vikings, I discussed men who rejected ritual and sacrifice to the gods, instead choosing to lean on their strength and luck. Now, it's likely that in spite of not holding ritual to the gods, that the belief in luck remains strong. Kettle Salmon puts his faith in his luck in a duel, despite adamantly not giving sacrifice to Odin. And the atheists recruited by Olaf II in his campaign discussed their strength and luck as having served them well enough thus far. But these were non-religious men who still managed to foster their luck, and it seems that their luck did not abandon them. But we do have stories of men who were abandoned by luck. Some of them are just bad people, either selfish or lazy, for example, making their bed and lying in it, as it were. But being a luckless man did not mean that you were a bad person. In fact, there are two standout examples of luckless men outlawed in Iceland who are celebrated heroes. They have great skill and wit, but seem to be abused by their destiny. These men are Gisli the Outlaw and Gretar the Strong. Let me tell you a little about them. Gisli is a man who, through a miscarriage of justice, is outlawed in Iceland and is forced to live a life on the run. The act that he committed was killing a man who had killed his sworn brother. The act seems to have been compounded by the fact that this was done during a celebration. However, when you know about the things that tend to get settled in arbitration in Icelandic sagas, it does seem that this could have been solved in a way that wasn't outlawry. For example, there is a case where a man is attacked on the road, kills the men attacking him, and is still forced to pay compensation to his attacker for killing the men who attacked him. <laughs> Icelandic standards of law were wild in the Viking Age. If you want a decent understanding of how Icelandic law worked 
in the Viking Age, as recorded by the sagas, I heavily suggest Njal's saga, which is about a lawyer in the Viking Age trying helplessly to stop an escalation of killings and feuding between families and friends as they pay each other silver in compensation for lives on a regular basis. It's also considered one of the greatest epics of Icelandic storytelling from the saga writing period. Gisli's particular situation is one where he carried out revenge according to a duty to his sworn brother. And in Icelandic culture of the time, this is something that probably could have been settled given the facts of the case. But he entrusts his case to others who the saga tells of their mishandling of the matter at the legal gathering. As a result, Gisli is an outlaw, meaning that anyone can kill him for any reason. And anyone caught sheltering him is also in violation of the law, and many of his old friends abandon him as a result. Assassins chase Gisli for 13 years straight. He retains an honorable persona throughout the story, helping those willing to give him shelter and escaping when those who help him are put in any unreasonable risk, sometimes through rather absurd antics. But despite his honorable deeds and wide respect, Things just refuse to go well for him. If, if you're reading this saga and you're waiting for, like, the good things, nothing good happens to this man. He is just eternally fucked. He eventually takes up residence in an underground passage at his former farm, now run by his wife, as outlaws lose all of their property and women could still own property. Spies come and visit the farm regularly, but he isn't found until after he's been there for years, troubled by prophetic dreams of his eventual death and losing everyone he loves. Finally, the assassins catch up to him and he makes his final stand. Gisli fights his best, and even his wife and daughter fight against the assassins using a club, though they do get pushed aside. And actually, in helping him, they prevent him from killing the lead assassin. And through the course of fighting as one man against many, Gisli is severely wounded, even having to collect his intestines and secure them back in his body with a belt, before finally killing one more man in an act of sheer defiance. The lead assassin goes to celebrate with the man who hired him, who happens to be married to Gisli's sister, Thordis, further complicating the matters in this sordid story. During the celebration, she grabs his sword and, in a failed attempt to kill him, inflicts a permanent injury by splitting open his leg. Her husband stops her from finishing the job and pays the man compensation for his wounds. Thordis announces then and there that she's divorcing her husband, declaring everyone present as witnesses, and then leaves. Gisli's saga shows that a man can try to do everything right, and yet luck seems fated to run against you. A similar case happens with Greta the Strong, a Viking strongman who became a folk hero in Iceland that is also known as a monster hunter. However, his luck is actually taken from him by a supernatural monster that he winds up fighting on the countryside. Gisli has no such explanation, and the sorcerer that blocks his luck seems to be a later Christian addition to the saga in order to explain the story. However, it can be argued that Gisli incurred the wrath of Freyr in the saga, as Gisli killed during a celebration dedicated to Freyr. And this is when he seems to lose his luck. As a deity, Freyr seems to be especially offended by bloodshed in his presence in the various sagas. And the man who was killed was a strong adherent to Freyr. And this is shown in the saga as Freyr doesn't let snow fall on his grave. It isn't explicitly stated, but his luck may have turned with Freyr's anger. In Greta's case, he's fighting through the night against some kind of mixture between a draugr and a misshapen monster named Glam. And this creature curses him before the powerful Viking finally removes his head. But his life thereafter is fraught with terrible luck as he too becomes an outlaw and is constantly on the run. And for 15 years he is on the run, continuing to slay monsters and helping out those who are kind to him along the way. But finally, he too is killed. But the act of the monster Glam taking Greta's luck 
shows us that luck can be removed. And indeed, we see another example of this in Eagle's saga, in which Eagle curses King Eric Bloodaxe with rune magic. He slams a decapitated horse head onto a pole inscribed with runes and places that into the ground, letting the land spirits know of Eric Bloodaxe's misdeeds both against the gods and against men. And as a result, King Eric's luck runs out, and he is chased out of Norway and eventually killed abroad. It seems that the Viking view of luck is far more complex than we'll ever really know, but it's definitely not something that is left up to random chance. It's seen as far more than that. It's governed by personal action, by the threads of our destiny as woven by the Norns, by the guardian spirits watching over our families. From what little we have of the Norse discussing luck, we can build an incomplete view of what they might have believed. But it's clear from what we have that there's so much of it that we'll never know. As far as personal practice, I've found that giving sacrifice to the Hamingya is an important part of how I approach heathenry. And it's a ritual that could be potentially done as a family or household practice, as the Hamingya is an aspect of the soul that unites the family in your luck. We don't have historical details on how this ritual was conducted in the Viking Age. So it is something that can be easily adapted into a personal practice. This is one of those examples of that weird dichotomy of the advantage and disadvantage of the lack of information. On the one hand, a wealth of information was lost as the particulars of these rituals were just not recorded. However, the loss of this information is a boon to modern practice, preventing orthodoxy according to the letter of ancient texts. Not that any heathens are prone to asserting that their way is the only way. I can't say that with a straight face. Let me know your thoughts as well. I find this concept of luck incredibly interesting, and I've wanted to make a video covering it for some time, but there's so many moving parts to it in ways that it would affect our lives. There's honestly a ton more to discuss with this topic. But let me know what else you would want to explore within this, or how luck affects your practice, or hell, let's just discuss the badassery of Gizli and Greta. <laughs> but with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Clicking the like and subscribe buttons grant luck in the form of new videos on heathenry in your feed. And the bell could be seen as the channel's humming ya. Call to her if you wish. And remember to find a way or make one. Boy, you best just wait. I'm going to tie my intestines here up in a knot and kick your ass.